Uh, Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has a vision. The vision is concerning him. But let's not make the mistake that others make in assuming that it was only for him. In the book of, Pro uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, That which was is that which shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. What, what is one of the best ways of discerning what is going to happen in the future? Look what happened in the past. Because he did it once, he'll do it again. God speaketh once, yea, twice, in a dream and a vision. And this is what we're dealing with in the book of Daniel. So it happened once. It had a partial fulfillment in the book of Daniel in Nebuchadnezzar's day. It will have a complete, perfect fulfillment in the latter days. And, of, and I'm not going to go over this whole vision that Nebuchadnezzar had. You read this on your own. But I want you to notice that in this vision that Nebuchadnezzar has, uh, let's see if I can find this. Let's start in verse 15. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast in the grass of the earth. Now, this vision typically was for Nebuchadnezzar, who went, who went out, stood out on his balcony, beheld his kingdom, his heart was just full of his own pride. Look at what I have done. Boy, that ought to be a lesson to us. And God smote him. And he literally, I mean, his hair grew. I mean, just, just ugly things all over his body. They had to put him out literally in the field of the palace. And he ate grass like an ox for how long? Seven years. Can you think of something in the Bible prophetically that happens for seven years? Think about it. Okay? I'm not going to go into that detail tonight, but I just want you to think about what the Bible is trying to tell you about the future that's going to happen on this planet. And then at the end of seven years, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is, is lifted back up again. But notice what he has said in verse 16. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a what heart be given him? Think of who a beast is. Revelation 13, I saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. This beast heart that was given to Nebuchadnezzar basically turned it literally in this time turned Nebuchadnezzar into an animal for seven years. His senses had gone. His, his humanity was gone from him for seven years. He was as a beast. Do you remember how... Um, I think it was Peter who described the false prophets of the last days. And he said, these as natural, brute, what? Think about it. They had the spirit of the beast and they were operating under the spirit of the beast. And I heard uh, Brother Mike Hutzel give an excellent, excellent um, teaching on this. He said, the difference between humans and beasts has to do with control temperance. He said, if you were in your house in, at night and you heard an intruder coming in your house and you went and stood in a doorway down the hall and you were waiting for the intruder to come by you so you could shoot him or club him if you wanted to spare his life. And as that intruder went by, he stepped on your toes. Do you have the ability to not scream out? We have control over our impulses. Say amen. That's what makes us human. God give us the power of choice. That's why he put two trees in the midst of the garden. And God said, choose. He set two trees before Israel, one called Jesus and one called Barabbas. And God said to Israel, choose. Okay? Now, is there a race tonight? Okay. Oh, we better hurry then, okay? So <laughs> anyway, uh, where was I going with that? Anyway, if your dog was sitting in that same doorway and the intruder came down the hall, stepped on his toe, does the dog have the ability to control his impulses? This would be not evolution, but de-evolution. And I think that humanity in this great awakening that, they're that is going to take place, this paradigm shift that we talked about is going to happen, I believe that a spirit of a beast is going to take over mankind. Are you with me? That's what I think is going to happen. Job chapter 10, verse 14. 
Job chapter 10, verse 14. See, I'm making you look at the, the Bible tonight instead of me putting it up on the screen. I want you to notice, I like to do word studies in the Bible. And so I just studied Revelation 13, and he calls us all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. How many? Six. God has a pattern. He has an order. He's teaching you something. He's teaching you to count. So we can chase down the number six in the scriptures and get an understanding of why God said this. By the way, that Walmart thing last night where it says live better, the symbol is, guess how many points it has? Okay? He calls us all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a what? Everybody say mark. A mark in their right hand or in their forehead, so that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So let's study the mark in the scriptures. Job chapter 10, verse 14. If I sin, then thou markest me. What is the mark associated with right out of, right out of the bat here? Sin. How many of y'all know what sin is? Say Amen. Okay, you're good at it. Okay? If I sin, thou markest me. And by the way, the beast is called the man of what? Sin. He is, he is the sum total of all of mankind's sinfulness. If you were to pile it all up, it would be this man of sin. This earth is only going to get what they have asked for. Four, through their iniquities. Psalm 130, verse 3. Aren't you glad I put all these in order? <coughs> Psalm 130, verse 3. If thou, Lord, shouldest do what? Mark iniquities. O Lord, who shall stand? Now, I, I love themes in the Bible because they're so simple. Think of things in the Bible that stand. Paul said, having done all to stand, to withstand, to stand, stand fast. Standing is the opposite of falling. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Dagon was stood in front of the Ark of the Covenant. But what happened to him? He fell. How art thou standing, O Lucifer? No. How art thou fallen, O Lucifer? The dragon took his tail and took one-third of the stars, and they did what? They fell to the earth. There is that day shall not come except a what? A stand first? A falling away first. So think of, boy, I could, I'm going to get mean. I, I, I get mean sometimes. These guys walk up to people. I got the I got the Holy Ghost on me. Boom! And they hit somebody in the head. And what do they do? Do they stand? I'll tell you my testimony by the grace of God. M many years ago, I was hungry for what I thought God wanted to give me in my life, and I went to a Pentecostal church. And I went forward at the end, and they came by, and I, here I am. God, God, I'll take anything, anything you want to give me. I'll do. And I was. I was being honest with God. And so they come by. Bam. And there was somebody behind me going. And I didn't fall. And they come by me again. Come on. Johnny Bench back there. And I didn't fall. By the grace of God, I didn't fall. Because when God's Spirit is on you, you don't fall. Isn't that beautiful? Aren't you glad that we can look at the Bible and know the truth from error? Can I hear you say, are we not bold enough to say amen? amen. We can know the truth from error, folks. And don't let anybody slap you on the head, including the missus. <laughs> Sorry. Huh? Too late. Too late. <laughs> Mama can do it. 
If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? So what's going to happen? God is going to mark iniquities. And what's going to happen when he does? They'll fall away. <whistles> Jeremiah 2, 22. That used to be a TV show, didn't it? Room 2, 22. Boy, that's a long time ago. Jeremiah 2, 22. For though thou wash thee with nitre and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is what? Marked before me, saith the Lord. Once the iniquity is marked, you can't wash it off. It's permanent. Amen? It's permanent. Does God prohibit you making markings on your skin with ink? Sure, it's in the law. He said, don't do it. Okay? Because when you get one of them nasty tattoos, what happens? You just can't get it off, can you? Okay? Now, if you have a tattoo, I don't think you're going to hell because you have a tattoo. Okay? But iniquities is different. When God marks iniquities, there's not a soap in the world that's going to be able to wash it off. Okay? Romans 16, 17. I love the Bible. I love the Bible. I'm glad I don't have to figure it out on her own. Romans 16, 17. Man, oh man. This is bad. This is a bad one here. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the dark doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. You know what God's saying? He's, God, teaches a, God teaches the doctrine of separation, not coming together. God teaches the doctrine of separation. We have, we have jumped into this, this bag in today's church that let's all just try to be one together. It doesn't work. And it won't work until we are the one body of Jesus Christ. It won't work. And all it does is causes divisions. It's all it does. Okay? But there are those who will purposely cause divisions in the home. Hey, moms and dads, husbands and wives, wives, if you detect that there's some Jezebel after your husband, she is trying to cause a division in your home, in your church. That's why I tell you what, go get them. Amen? Amen. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. So not only are we seeing it associated with sin, but we're seeing it associated with those who are espousing false doctrines. God's going to mark them. Okay? Then Revelation 13, 16, 17, we read that. Revelation 14, 9. Now, we are, just, we are just not show slides. We just sit here and do Bible study all night. Amen? Amen? But I promised you I'd show the slides. Revelation 14, verse 9. And the third angel. What, what number angel? The third angel. That's important. God sets a pattern and a theme. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment, torment ascendeth up how long? So does that mean that they're going to be annihilated and it's going to be over with for them? Listen, I'll be honest with you. If hell lasted 500 million years and then it would be over, it would be tolerable. But it doesn't. It goes up. The smoke of their what? Their torment. Their conscious torment is forever and forever. I 
do not want to go to hell when I die. I don't. Because it's forever and I don't want to go. If it was for a hundred thousand million years, it would be tolerable if it would end. But it's not. It's forever. Don't go to hell. Amen? Amen. Don't go to hell. Genesis chapter 3. God has an order. He has a cadence. He has a pattern. He has a rhythm in the Bible. Numbers are important. God showed me that the numerical things, if you want to know what numbers mean, go to the Genesis chapter. You may not understand it all in one day. I didn't. But you study and you study. You see it throughout the scriptures. You'll see it. So before I, I show you the symbols that I'm going to show you tonight, I'm going to give you the biblical background for what I'm going to tell you tonight. Okay? Uh, and th this is all based upon everything that I said last night and everything that I said the night before. Um, so anyway... The number three, it's one of, the, a lot of these numbers in the Bible, they have a dual meaning, okay? How many of you think the number 13 is bad? Okay? Let's count. She had a name written on her forehead. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Thirteen words on Mystery Babylon's head. How many times did they march around Jericho? Thirteen times. One time a day for six days, seven times on the seventh day. That's 13. And Jericho fell. Babylon is, Jericho is a prototype of mystery Babylon in the last days. Isn't that beautiful? That God shows us. And you know what? Hey, you know what brings Babylon down? Blow that old trumpet. Blow that old Bible trumpet. Amen? Amen. Listen, you got Babylon in your church? You just need to whoop your trumpet out and start blowing that thing. Amen? Babylon falls at the sound of the word of God. I love it. But watch this. That's harlot love. Is what that 13 represents. God has a pure love. It's characterized in the phrase love of God, which is mentioned exactly 13 times in your King James Bible. The great charity chapter is in 1 Corinthians what? Jesus walks around with 12 disciples. How many do we have? 13. He is, for God so loved the world that he gave the 12 a 13th. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So they have a dual meaning. So when we think of the number three, we think of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And if your Bible doesn't have that verse, you do not have a Bible. Okay? That verse is pivotal in the Scriptures. Go ye therefore and, teach, and baptizing them how? In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. The number three is the number for resurrection. The third day. The third day. All through the Bible, the third day. Watch this. Lazarus is dead in the tomb. What did, what did Jesus do to get him up? Did he, did he chant? Did he, did he shake rattles over him? <coughs> did he go? Um, 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 um. Did he start an IV? Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. Aren't you glad that Jesus said to you, Lazarus, come forth? Amen? Mm-mm. How many crosses? Because he was, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. He was numbered with the transgressors. Genesis chapter 3 is where sin shows up in the Bible. You think that's an accident? You think man put that there? No. God, God speaks in order. He's not the author of confusion. He's the author of order. So one, two, three. Now we have Lucifer, the serpent, who we talked about. And he speaks how many words to Eve in your King James? 46. It's the number of chromosomes you have in your body where your DNA is stored. Okay? So we're targeting the DNA. We're targeting the Word of God with the DNA. That's the book that God wrote in your cells. That's who you are. Okay? Does everybody follow that so far? So the number three is a number associated with sin. 
Let me, oh, oh, by the way, let me read this here. Yea, hath God said, these are the words that the serpent spoke. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Ye shall not surely die. He's promised her, promising her immortality. Then he said, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then you're what? Eyes. That is the 33rd word that is spoken to Eve. Your eyes shall be opened. Now, have you heard of what's called the third eye? It is Eastern mysticism. It is the occult. It is, we see it in the Indian religions. You see there the person there with the snake wrapped around his head? He has one eye, two eyes, but then he has his illuminated eye, his third one. And that's his third eye being opened. How many of you have ever seen something like that before? Who knows of a rock group who was called Third Eye Blind? Anybody ever heard of that? Okay, so now you know what they're talking about, don't you? Third eye blind refers to the fact that most people walk around and they're not illuminated through Eastern mysticism or drugs or sex or anything like that. They need their third eye open. And that's what Lucifer was promising Eve. So I want you to count. How many eyes did God give you? And aren't you glad? Amen? Amen. <laughs> one, two. But the devil wants to add one more. Your eye of illumination. Are you following me so far? Three eyes. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, the tree desired to make one wise. How many things here? Three. She took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and did eat. First John chapter 2 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life. How many? How many times was Jesus tempted in the wilderness? With the, with the lust of the flesh, turn the stone into bread. The lust of the eyes, see all these kingdoms? Pride of life. Cast yourself down, the angels will come and pick you up. Pride of life. You with me? The number three refers to sin. Now, we've already seen verses in the Bible where God said that he would mark sin. He would mark iniquities. The purpose behind the mark of the beast is God marking those who refuse Jesus Christ. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion. Now at the exact second that God sends strong delusion, the devil opens their third eye. They're simultaneous. They think they're illuminated now. They think that they are as gods, knowing good and evil because of the addition of the third eye. Follow this with me. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. See the pattern here? And these are all birthing terms, referring to the advent of the Antichrist. Let no man deceive you by any means, including Christian bookstores. For that day shall not come, except there come... That thou should mark his iniquities, who could stand? A falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Amen? Now let's get back to this. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof. Let's chase this word down for a minute in the scriptures. Proverbs chapter 1. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. How many of you know somebody like that? Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way. You follow that? What Eve was doing in the Garden of Eden is only typical of what most people that you know are doing right now. They're eating the fruit of of their own way. This is going to be typified in the last days when people, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, receive a mark on their right hand or forehead. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left, and the scripture was fulfilled which saith he was numbered, one, two, three, with the transgressors. 
For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of this prophecy, of this book. And we've spent two nights telling you that your DNA is the book of God. God wrote it. It's perfect. Amen? Amen. God did, listen, God didn't need the genetic scientist to manipulate it and add monkey DNA. Amen? Amen? I mean, who wants to be sitting around picking lice from somebody else's hair and eating it? <laughs> Amen? Amen. Oh. Listen, we don't, animals are gross. Amen? Amen? God gave us the ability and the intellect to clean ourselves up ourselves and not eat it. Amen? Amen. <laughs> if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Okay? And I submit to you that the plan is to add to the book. The plan is to add to the book. Does anybody know of a man by the name of Linus Pauling? Okay? No genetic scientist here. No biologist or anything like that. Okay. Back in the 1950s, 1940s and 1950s, there was, there was several scientists who were working on the idea of DNA. They were trying to work out, even though we couldn't see it, they were trying to work out with equations and chalk on boards and chemicals and I don't know what all was involved, but they were trying to figure out the formation of DNA. In the 1950s, two scientists succeeded named Watson and Crick and they won uh, Nobel Prize, whatever prizes they, they awarded them. They won those prizes for that and their names have gone down in history. Linus Pauling, however, uh, theorized at the same time, and he was close. But Linus Pauling, instead of Watson and Crick's model, where it had two strands, and we know now that that is the biblical formula for DNA, because this is two-strand DNA right here. Old Testament, New Testament. Amen? God speaketh once, God speaketh twice. And they're joined together. The Old Testament is joined together with the New Testament by way of what? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the four nucleotide base pairs that join the two strands of DNA. Isn't that beautiful? I love that. Because the Old Testament points you to the Gospels. The rest of the New Testament points you back to the Gospels, not the book of Acts. The way our United Pentecostal people believe. Okay? So that's not true. But Linus Pauling theorized that DNA actually had three strands. Now, he was wrong. Okay? But... He, he actually modeled what three-strand DNA would look like. And there it is on the screen. That is it, like an overhead view of what three-strand DNA would look like. Has everybody got that so far? Okay, so now I'm going to show you a symbol. Does the symbol and Linus Pauling's theory on three-strand DNA, do they look alike? Do they look similar? Yes. Everybody, just do this. Just go along with it. <laughs> Somebody's going, uh, is that a monkey? I don't know. Okay. So, in fact, let me, let me move ahead. Three-strand DNA, it's called the triple helix. Scientists are not content with the way two-strand DNA works because scientists love to play God. You believe that? They love to play God. And they think that the human genome has flaws and imperfections and oh my goodness, it's killing everybody. We're going to try to find the elixir of life, the fountain of youth, the philosopher's stone. We're going to try to find a way of making man live forever. So they started working with different scenarios and different ideas. And the current idea that they're all working on right now is called the triple helix model. This is an article from Scientific American and it says designing a new molecule of life. And so, and I, and I don't understand most of what these scientists are writing about, but I can pick up little things here and there. And what they're saying is, is that if they can figure out a way, and they're pretty close now, if they can figure out a way of adding a third string in the DNA sequence, a third strand, then most of your DNA problems will go away and you just simply won't die anymore. That's what they're saying. This article came out, the potential for gene repair via triple helix formation. Triple forming 
oligonial nucleotides can bind polypurine, polypyrimidine regions in the... I won't read the rest of that because I don't understand a word they're saying. But what I do understand is, is that, that really believe that adding a third strand of DNA to your two-strand DNA now will fix all of your problems. Now, the problem is your problem is your problem. I, I like what Mike said a while ago. Your greatest enemy is who, Mike? You. My greatest enemy is covered with skin, my skin, and it looks like me. The solution to our problem is not adding more life to this flesh. The solution to our problem is killing this flesh. Amen? Amen. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth within me. So this is man's attempt at gaining immortality without the cross. And you can't do it. But they're going to try. Okay? Now, we're going to talk about symbols tonight that I think are pointing to the potential or the possibility or, in my opinion, the probability that when they mingle themselves with the seed of men, they will do so by adding a third strand. Now, this is why we spent so much time looking at the number three. Because I want you to understand the biblical significance of the number three and how it relates to sin and how it relates to the mark of a beast. And remember, the they we're referring to in the book of Daniel are the principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. And those angels are beasts, aren't they? They're de the devil is. He's a dragon. He's a serpent. He has a beast nature about him. By the way, I love this, and I, I love to teach this. The dragon is a beast, and beasts were designed that they cannot escape their own nature. And God tells you in the Boy Scouts manual, the field guide here of Christianity, what happens when you encounter a dragon? You know what you do? Resist. And what happens when you resist? Resist the devil. He cannot escape his own nature. And if you just resist him, he'll flee. Amen? I mean, a lot of you people in here raise animals. You know, you know how they operate, don't you? You know, there's, cert there's certain ways to handle them. If you handle them right, you, you, you got them under your control. Therefore, God did give us dominion over beasts. Think about it. You have dominion over the beast, the devil. You know his trick now. All you got to do is stare him down and he'll leave. But isn't this interesting? In the beginning, God gave man dominion over beast. In the end, God gives the beast dominion over man. Wow. Why? People didn't resist. They didn't resist. Now, Let's talk about symbols. I'm sure that probably on some church somewhere you've seen this symbol. It's called the triketra. This is a symbol, and I'm going to show this to you tonight. This is a symbol for three-strand DNA. There are similar symbols that are associated with it. This is a triple helix. Now, so, some will say, well, that represents the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Ah, not so fast. God said no. God said don't carve images. He said don't do it. You've never seen me, so don't try to carve my image. God said in the book of Acts, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not think that the Godhead is like unto three things, gold, silver, or stone, graven by art, and man's device. So if somebody lies to you and says, Oh, that symbol's a symbol for God. You say, No, it's not. This is. God did use similitudes in the Bible, didn't he? Symbols. Noah was one of them. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Amen? God, the, all the symbols you need are right. You don't want to know what God looks like? This is what he's the Word. He looks like words. Amen? That's what he looks like. I love it. See, we don't have to carve out images. We don't have to grave out art devices to symbolize God. We just need to read the old book. So all this stuff, it's a replacement. It's a replacement. It's what it is. So while they say this is a symbol for God, you say the Bible says it's not. And you know that it's a lie. Now, here's what Albert Pike said. The blue degrees are but the outer court or portico of the temple.
Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. Their true explication is reserved for the adepts, the princes of masonry. He's talking about symbols and the power of symbols. In a book called Sacred Space, here's what the author wrote about symbols. She said, a symbol can act in two ways. First, it can be used to focus and project your energy through it. Second, a symbol can function as a magnifier and transmitter of energy. Even if you are not focusing attention on the symbol, symbols do have a life force of their own. They are many transmitting stations for subtle energies that are infused in our reality. Each symbol interacts with your energy field, constantly generating a force field that strengthens you. Now that's a bunch of new age gobbledygook, but there is a reality because devils are empowered by images, statues, and symbols. The Bible's very clear on this. Images, casting down what? imaginations and every lofty thing that exalts itself above God. That's what the Bible says. He said, do not have images of anything in heaven or anything in the earth or anything beneath the earth. Amen? Amen. Don't have them. God said, stay away from them. I don't have a fish on my bumper. Okay? Now, I got plenty of fish right here tonight. Amen? Who said that? <laughs> I don't have a fish on my bumper sticker. I don't have it on our cards. About the only symbol that I'll use is the cross, and that's it. I don't, ha I don't hang a dead Jesus on mine either. Amen? Okay? But I just don't like to use symbols because clearly there's power behind them. Uh, one author wrote, to cast a spell is to project energy through a symbol. 1999 Psychic General and uh, Sabrina Cott Scott Company. In discussing psychic energy, Carl Jung specifically states, the psychological mechanism that transforms energy is the symbol. He said this in his work, The Symbols of Transformation. Now here's what I thought was really, really interesting. This was written by a man by the name of Richard Cassaro. Richard Cassaro is a marketing specialist. He has spent his life studying marketing techniques. How to market things to people. How to get you to buy something. He's an expert. Listen to what he says. Like the Mercedes logo, the Mitsubishi icon is also a sacred symbol that mimics the triketra. Three parts three-strand DNA, triple helix. And so are plenty of other corporate emblems. Their meaning is long forgotten, but they continue to draw us in, circumventing our logic and reason by tapping something primal within us. Experts once knew how to link these or similar icons to a consumer's raw emotions, to joy and happiness, to fear and confidence, to the feeling of flying down an open highway while casting life's worries to the wind so that suddenly a sacred religion is born. Drenched with the residue power of a potent age-old symbol, ready to attract the hearts and minds of millions. Once learned and associated, the symbol's identity and the emotions it elicits become ingrained into the mind forever, drawing us in again and again, entering the deepest unconscious of our unsuspecting minds. Sure, it sounds abstract, he says, unreasonable and illogical, but it works like magic. This was a marketing specialist, and he understood the power of symbols and logos and the effect that they have on our minds. Now, I will say this. I do not believe that Christians, born-again Christians, Bible-believing Christians, can be demon-possessed. Greater is he that is in me Amen. than he that is in the world. But they can sure talk a good talk. And when I end this talk tonight, you'll see where we're going with this. Because I think everybody in this room, I think we're living in days when we really, really, really need to start being careful. We're walking through a minefield with no map.
well, maybe we have a map. But we're walking through a minefield in these days. And let's be careful. Because greater men than us have fallen. Amen? Amen. Now, we're going to look at this triple helix. Remember, here's my theory. When they mingle themselves with the seed of men, I believe that they're going to add a third strand to man's DNA. They're going to violate God's word by adding to God's word. Does everybody follow that so far? Okay. So let me explain how this works. This actually, this actually is in the real world right now. Somebody brought me uh, some symbols of the book of the Mormon church. Let me explain it like this. Here is the word of God, King James Bible. Amen? Amen. It's perfect. Doesn't need anything added to or taken away. And God said, don't do it. Amen. Joseph Smith comes along. And here, Old Testament, New Testament, joined together by four nucleotides, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just like DNA, and it's perfect. God said, don't, don't add to it. Joseph Smith comes along and takes another testament of Jesus Christ and adds it to the King James Bible. What has he just done? Not only has he added to the Word of God, but in symbolic fashion, he's added a third strand to the two-strand DNA sequence. How many of you see that? Okay? That's what's going on. And there's so much Freemasonry in the Mormon church. I mean, I, I don't even want to spend time talking about it tonight because they are so entrenched in Freemasonry. When you go to the temple in Salt Lake City, Utah, what do you see? Count, count for me. What do you see? One, two, three. Three-strand DNA. The three entrances into this church. Did you get what I just said? Because I told you a while ago I was going to tell you what that meant. Most Gothic cathedrals in <laughs> Europe were built by Freemasons and Templars who had this secret in their mind. And they built these Gothic cathedrals with these pagan influences in them with three entrances into them. Representing the three-strand DNA sequence. Here's what Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma says. For the master, the compass of faith is above the square of reason, but both rest upon the holy scriptures and combine to form the blazing star of truth. So you walk into a mason hall, and here you have two-strand DNA, the word of God, and then they take their secret and they plant it right on top of it, mingling it with it. Three-strand DNA. Even in Masonic rituals, they have a ritual where these three men join together and they form a triple helix, a triketra. And they, it's called the three times three. And they pronounce the hidden secret name of God, jah bull on Jah for Jehovah. Bull for Baal. On for Osiris. God said, you shall not name the names of other gods. And this ritual that they have in their royal arch degree ceremony is showing the advent of the days when man will have triple helix DNA. You even see there at the top the... I like my laser here. What is that? Three-headed snake forming a triketra. To me now, it's as plain as day. The ladder that we talked about last night, the Masonic ladder... How many rungs? Three rungs reaching from earth to heaven. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. The triple helix, three strand DNA. Look on top of, of the, the uh, image there. You see the, the triple crown that is being worn. It represents the triple helix. Adding to the word of God, three strand DNA. Now I'm going to start to move kind of fast on these, all right? Um, one New Age website I read called New DNA, New Consciousness, New Intelligence. Channeled information. And what is channeling? Someone who consults with a what? Familiar spirit. Exactly the way the Bible said. This demon said, for those who embrace the change... What did Obama run on? He can keep the change. Amen? Amen. Give me back my taxes. Amen. For those who embrace... By the way, Obama 
represents to the New Age movement. There was one New Age writer who wrote about him before the election, and when I read this, I told my wife, Obama's going to be the next president of the United States. Deepak Chopra said that Barack Obama represents the transformation of America. And he wasn't kidding. For those who embrace the change and the newness, they are coming into a new way of being, the new Superman. The third strand of DNA developing in your body makes you a Christ. A living, holy trinity. In realizing yourself as the living trinity, you will move beyond duality. The new amino acids will make it easier for your brain to fire off the new codes. Masonic author John T. Lawrence said, Thus we Masons have three degrees, three great lights, three lesser lights, three principal officers, three assistant officers, three sets of three working tools, three steps, three pillars, three ornaments, three articles of furniture, three movable jewels and three immovable jewels, three grand principals, three assassins, three searching lodges, three who rule a lodge, three grand masters, and three orders of architecture. What do you think they were talking about? In fact, the respect paid by Freemasons to this number goes far to suggest that our mysteries have affinities, not only with the Egyptian rites and ceremonies, but I thought Masons were Christians. But with those of a good many other nations. In the mythologies of Greece and Rome, the thunderbolt of Jupiter was three-forked. Three-strand DNA. Triple helix. The scepter of Neptune was a trident. I have a picture of that. In Hindu mythology, the worshiper of Vishnu has his forehead decorated with a trident. There is a trident right there. And this Masonic writer is telling you that it represents the magical three of Freemasonry, which is triple helix DNA. Here is the trident there and the third eye associated with Eastern mysticism. By the way, Eastern mysticism has made so many inroads now into the church nowadays. It scares me to death what's going on. Through contemplative prayer. That is prayer where you empty your mind and you go into a trance-like state and there you can hear the voice of God. That's channeling a familiar spirit, people. That has moved so far and now it's moving into Free Will Baptist. Barbara Marciniak wrote a book called The Path of Empowerment, and she used this symbol to, so you could visualize the path to empowerment, the triple helix. This symbol is associated with a goddess, a Celtic goddess called Seridwen. Seridwen is the goddess of, watch this, transformation. She is the goddess of wisdom and the crone of the Wiccan trinity. She is the keeper of the black cauldron of... Immortality. Remember, you can live forever. The, uh, I, have, I have people who watch our broadcast in the Netherlands. Okay? And they sent me some information. There is, a, there is a Nordic symbol that a lot of those people would know about called the Valknut. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. But it's called the Knot of the Slain. It is a three-strand rope. And it hangs this person from a tree. Remember what we saw about that last night. Who is it that hangs from, a, hangs from a tree? The Antichrist. Okay? In Freemasonry, as soon as you walk into the lodge, they hang what's called a cable toe around your neck. It is a three-strand cord around your neck. Guess what it represents? Three-strand DNA. Morals and Dogma says the initiate, was, the initiate was invested with a cord of three threads, so twined as to make three times three and called zenar. Hence comes our cable toe. That threefold cord is spoken of in the scriptures. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. I preached a message on that here a while back. We have it on our website. The triple tau of Freemasonry represents the triple helix of three strand DNA. The delta or the pyramid symbol is a symbol for change or a symbol for transformation. Now, I don't understand this little equation here, but apparently mathematically it represents transformation. So we're dealing with images of like three strands or even a pyramid used to denote three strand or triple helix of DNA. 
The British mathematician and astrologer and occultist John Dee used this symbol as his signature in some of his manuscripts. When a mason writes out words or initials, they always put three dots next to their initials. You'll see it in Masonic manuals. If you see somebody who writes their name this way, they're a mason. And those three dots represent the triple helix. The, the phrase abracadabra is a mystical, magical term. It's not something from cartoons. It's not something that little magicians talk about. It is a magical formula that works, and it always has to do with the three-sided pyramid or the triple helix. The fleur de lis. Do you see three strands of DNA here? This was the symbol that Dan Brown spoke of, that uh, Bajan and Lee talked about in their book, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, of a secret society called the Priory of Zion. Now, there's those who say the Priory of Zion didn't exist. I believe that a secret society, either by this name or some other one, existed, and the three-strand DNA, or the triple helix, Fleur de Lis, was their symbol. We see it on maps. We talked about the rose compass last night. The, 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 the Fleur de Lis always points to the north. Remember what the book of Jeremiah says is coming from the north. Go study this. From the north. Isn't that right, Brother John? From the north. From the north. They shall come from the north. They're invaded from the north. Think about it. I, I won't get into all that. But anyway, the flag of the city of St. Louis is a Masonic flag. Because here you have the elements of two things being formed into one. Remember what that represented from last night. Sons of God, daughters of men flowing together. Now the imagery here is supposed to be of the confluence of the Missouri River and the Mississippi River joining together into one. But then you have the symbol of the fleur de lis, the triple helix, three-strand DNA. By the way, St. Louis is referred to as the gateway to the West. It is in Masonic ideology where this opposite of the west meets this opposite of the east and they are joined together in the city of St. Louis. That's why it's there. The Hierophant, the tarot card of the Hierophant. Let's talk about him for a minute. The Hierophant teaches matters of faith, religion, belief, and morality. He is a wise teacher, full of esoteric and occult knowledge. He aids in understanding the occult mysteries. He holds the keys of transformation. He oversees the initiation of people into the mystery religions of ancient Babylon. Now it said that he holds in his hand the keys of transformation. What is he holding in his hand? A triketra. That is the triple helix. He, hold, he is holding in his hand the keys to transformation. He also has his other hand with three fingers extended. One, Two, three. Have you ever seen someone do that before? A religious figure of some kind. In martial arts, when they practice martial arts, you will often find a martial artist centering himself with his three fingers. It's in, it's in every corner of the earth. Uh, in the painting that Leonardo da Vinci painted of Jesus praying to John the Baptist, John the Baptist is blessing him with a three-finger blessing. This image of Sophia or Mary Magdalene or Shekinah as she is referred to, the wife of God or the harlot woman of God, the consort of the gods, Isis, Ashtaroth, Ishtar, that's who she is referred to, Venus, Diana. She extends her three fingers in a symbol that she is the giver of immortality and eternal life. Baphomet on both hands, extends three fingers upwards and three fingers downwards. He is telling you the secret. Remember, Baphomet is the fusion of the opposites, male and female together. Fusion of the gods with man. Man becoming the divine man, the God man. And it's given in the symbol of the three fingers, the triple helix. This... Um, this symbol outside of the McAllister Masonic Temple is indicative of their belief of the number three and its magical power, the triple helix. You've seen the illuminated eye on the capstone on the back of your $1 bill. Is that a Christian symbol? Is that God's eye? No. It is an occult symbol. It's a Masonic symbol and is referencing illumination. What did the devil promise Eve in the Garden of Eden? 
Her eyes should be open. He promised her illumination. And the reason why that it's a triangle is that it represents the triple helix. Remember, that delta symbol is a symbol for transformation. Outside of the Masonic Temple in McAllister, Oklahoma, you see the symbols there. By the way, here you see the cross in the crown. Sons of God mingling with the daughters of men is what that represents. Notice the triangle inside the circle. We're going to see that in a little bit. The triple tau inside the triangle inside of the circle. All of these indicative of the triple helix. This tapestry is located in the Vatican, in one of the chapels in the Vatican. Notice that you have the, the, the G, the letter G, or the all-seeing eye, Inside of the triangle here, that's three-strand DNA. Right here, you see that this goddess, huh, imagine the Vatican having a goddess. She is wisdom. She is Sophia. She is Shekinah. She has her three fingers extended here, showing you the secret. By the way, this here is the Ouroboros, the serpent with its tail in its mouth. You know what that means. The heaven on earth temple that I showed you last night, how many rings? That is what joins humans with the divine. By the way, the Chinese believed that at one point that this exact place is where the gods came down to the earth and mated with their women. That is exactly what's recorded in Genesis chapter 6. Exactly. The Chinese have a secret society it's called the Triads. And these are the mafia secret societies in China. There was a book written in the 1950s called The Mark. Huh. I wonder what it's about. Notice the symbol that they use. The Mark was about man's next phase of evolution. Where man becomes perfected and he becomes godlike. And the book was called The Mark. The uh, 2002 Winter Games in Salt Lake City. Who's headquartered in Salt Lake City? The Mormons. In Salt Lake City, Utah, they erected the Olympic torch. It's three-strand DNA, people. It was a triple helix that they erected in the 2002 Winter Olympics. How many of you ever heard of a group called Led Zeppelin? Yeah, come on. Okay. Look at their symbols. They were receiving instructions from familiar spirits. Their symbols, and by the way, I'm, showing, I'm just showing you elements in the occult world right now of triple helix and, and, and rock and roll is of the occult. Say amen. amen. Here's, a, here's a current rock group called AFI. Notice their symbol. Atriscula or a three-strand DNA, a triple helix. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Duh. What does it look like? It's a triangle, Cleveland, Ohio. You saw the movie National Treasure, right? What was the secret? It was the triple helix. That was the treasure that Nicolas Cage in the movie said had to be shared with all mankind. Get it? That's what the movie was about. Have any of you ever seen this symbol before? Guess what it is? The triple helix <coughs> represents transformation. The New Age movement is about a new age of peace and happiness that's going to extend to all mankind. Unfortunately, this peace is without Christ. And without Christ, there is no peace. But their symbol for their transformation and change is the triple helix. Politics and government. The mafia comes from Sicily, Italy. This is their flag, their symbol. The Mafia is a secret society, okay? The Department of Transfer Transportation, that's their symbol. The Trilateral Commission, you ever heard of them? They're the guys that are meeting, that are plotting the course of our world, bringing us into a new world order. That's their symbol. This is outside the Pentagon. A man came to me when I was in Baltimore, and he said, Pastor Mike, do you think that possibly that... The, when, they, when, they add their, when they mingle themselves with the seed of men, that it could add a third strand to man's DNA. We talked about it. He showed me the picture. He's right. 
uh, this symbol. You will see a statue outside of most courthouses. This statue holding a pair of scales. We talked about that last night. She's holding her three fingers extended, triple helix. The National Occupational Health and Safety Commission, triple helix. The, um, I got to read this one up close here. This is the Department for Environment, Food, and Rural Affairs in Great Britain or the United Kingdom. Notice their symbol, the triple helix. Environmentally Sustainable Systems Limited. There is association with this symbol and the environmental movement. Everything going green in Al Gore is associated with this symbol. The National Institutes of Health uses this symbol. Apex, now here's where it gets interesting. Because a guy sent me this in the email, said, Pastor Mike, take a look at this symbol. Tell me what you think. I said, I think it looks like a triple helix. And I asked him what, what this is. He said, everybody that gets paid by the government in the United Kingdom gets paid through Apex. Remember, no man might buy or sell save he had the what? Look at what it's associated with. Here is the Netherlands Chamber of Commerce. You cannot buy or sell in the Netherlands without approval of this government organization. They use the triple helix. This uh, organization here, the triple helix of learning, assessment, and pedagogy. This has to do with the educational system, referring to the new way they're teaching kids as the triple helix. Here it is here, teaching, research, knowledge transfer, the triple helix. Here's uh, from the University of Edinburgh. They talk about the fusion. We were talking about this in the hall a while ago. The fusion of industry, government, and education into one giant monster. And that's what we have right now in this country because the government is taking, they have, they have the, in, the educational institutions. Now they're taking over the businesses, aren't they? One by one, starting with the banks, then the car companies, then the hospitals and the insurance companies. And it's a triple helix model. Uh, here it is again, the triple helix learning process. The, uh, this is from the United Kingdom. Victorian essential learning standards, the triple helix approach. Social learning, dis discipline-based learning, interdisciplinary learning, the triple helix, industry, uh, university, and government. This was a, uh, a book written as a new model for how fascism is going to work in the world. Here it is here. I'm moving through these kind of quick. The triple helix of university, industry, and government relations. The triple helix international network, industry, university, and government. Triple helix consulting. The Triple Helix Review, a science review, and notice the article says, have we stopped evolving? Triple Helix. Now let's look at brand names. All of these symbols. Some lady sent me probably 500 symbols to look at, and I'm using about 20 of them up here on the screen. Uh, let me get up here where I can point to these real quick and move through these real fast. The recycling symbol. Uh, the, uh, the biohazard symbol. The... This symbol from a company called Ashridge. Do you want to go further? Evolution, quality products, America Online. This is a Russian company called Aster, which means star, triple helix, Autogen, AKG, Agio. Uh, this uh, company here called uh, Creating a Greener Future, a company called Bauer, Dimension Data, Eurovision, Europe Online, Internet Company, uh, Internova, an energy company, Phoenix. Entertainment Group, Ecological Integrity, Triple Helix, AG Communication Systems, a subsidiary of Lucent Technologies. That was named after Lucifer. AT&T used to own them. How many of you have seen that symbol before? Do you know what Adobe is? It's brick. What did they build the Tower of Babel of? What do Masons work with? da 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 Synergenic. You know what synergy means, right? We discussed that last night. I found this this morning. The Thomson Reuters Foundation. It's an alert network. They use the triple helix. Google's new browser. And I wouldn't suspect Google, but they showed up last weekend at the Bilderberg meeting. The Bilderberg meeting is where all the top people in the world get together and say, here's how we're going to run the world this year. And if you don't believe that, that's too bad. It's true. Triple Helix. Here is a company called RFR. I could not find what the company was, but notice that in their Triple Helix, they have two symbols for the world and a symbol for the stars. 
melded together. Next level insurance broker, the triple, uh, triple Helix Technology Corporation. This is a commercial I saw on television the other day. I went, no way. Hair care product. You see the three strands DNA here? Do you see it? It's here. And they're pouring these chemicals, and they all form this three-strand DNA, and when they land in the jar, that's what they form, the triscula or the triketra. Pantene, Nestle, Pure Life, one, two, three. Uh, genetically altered is the symbol here. This is a skateboard company. It has three-strand DNA on here, and the statement on the skateboard says, Evolved. SSM Healthcare, Immortality, uh, Go To Market Strategies, the Triple Helix. You, <laughs> you just now caught it, huh? We're talking about major corporations. And this is a major corporation. And I'm, a, I'm assuming they bought up all these little companies in Lebanon. Is that correct? Okay. That's their symbol. I was at the store taking pictures of symbols. I bought some CD labels and I went to check out and I looked at the card scanner so that no man might buy or sell save it had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. And the company was in Genico and they used the triple helix as their logo. They are the world's largest manufacturer of these machines and they're based in France. Okay? No man might buy or sell. Now let's look at it in religion. The Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, I've read some things on this website. They use the, the pyramid and the triple helix as their model. They believe in what's called transhumanism, man making his next step of evolution, becoming the divine. Transpersonal psychology, uh, transformation is what it's about. Martial arts, use that symbol. We talked about that earlier. Don't let your kids do this. Okay, moving on. <laughs> the Christian Medical Fellowship. Their, their newspaper, their newsletter is called the Triple Helix. Infusion Church uses the Triple Helix model for their spiritual DNA. Where did they get the inspiration to do this from? Not from the Bible. Familiar spirits. The Pope wears... The triple crown, the triple helix. He holds the three fingers as his blessing, as his papal seal of blessing. And by the way, he draws a chromosome when he does it. Granger Community Church. These, these guys are on the forefront of the emerging church movement. They're one of the most wicked churches. Look what they're marketing. No wonder they use that symbol. Okay? You've heard of this group? so-called Christian group, that's their symbol. Fusion Church, better together. You get it now, don't you? The fusion of the heavenly with the earthly. This is a youth seminar. So much of this stuff is moving into the youth ministry movement, the big companies. This is a seminar called Move. They're using that as a way to transform the youth in your church. Don't let them do it. Trinity Church, spiritual DNA, the genetic code of our faith. Core discipleship, the triple helix. They refer to the three-strand church resource or the three-strand church model for church growth. The Elijah List, I talked about this last night. They talk about uh, three-strand DNA or your un unique DNA. They believe that you have God's DNA inside of you. They market a thing called spiritual transformation where they're going to activate the, the divine inside of you. That is new age. How about this? The New King James Bible represented the transformation of the church from the old way, the old path that God told us to seek out. Amen. And it represented, watch this, because the devil does everything in steps. And churches who stood with the King James, who didn't like the NIV, the new King James came along with that symbol and they, and they stepped. You believe that? 
The book, The Aquarian Conspiracy, was about social transformation. She used the three-strand helix as her symbol. She says in this book, the mysteries we will explore are not remote from us, but ourselves, our brains, our bodies, the genetic code. Our own biology is the key. Homo nobis, or a new human being. Human metamorphosis. The chromosomes are splitting to go forward with a new pattern of life. That's why she used that symbol, and she knew what she was doing. We see it in Wicca, or the occult. The TV show uh, Charmed uses that symbol in their book of witchcraft. The Christian music group Avalon. They represent the transformation of Christian music. A church called Imagine Church, that is forbidden in scriptures. We're to cast down imaginations. But the new church is not based upon the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. It is based upon the spirit of harlots and your creativity, your imagination, your intuition. The, three, the triple helix there. Ecumenical council, triple helix. Church planning, spiritual movement, community transformation, global, all these words about transformation. This, this church called South Hills Church, elevate your life. That's evolution, folks. That's Freemasonry. That's the exact same symbol as was on that book called The Mark. And it was about the evolution of mankind into Godhood. Where did they get this from? They were inspired, folks, by familiar spirits. Now, but the sons of Belial shall be all of them as what? God, we talked about the sons of Belial last night. Those are, the, those are the children of the devil, the seed of the serpent. And God equates them as thorns. Proverbs, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard. That represents DNA of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with what? Listen to me. Let's, 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 do, some, let's, let's do some little serious thinking here. What happens to you when you get away from prayer and the word of God? What happens in your life? Boy, the weeds and the thorns show up. Raise your hand say amen if you know that to be true. Amen. See, this is where I'm headed with this tonight. This is for you. Because if we're not careful, the thorns are, are going to overrun us. And now we know that the thorns represent what the children of Belial will bring to mankind. So think about it. Do not think that you're exempt. Don't think that. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and what? And I will also command the clouds that there rain no rain upon it. Rain is a picture of the word of God. My doctrine shall, dis, shall fall as the rain. And some fell among thorns, and thorns grew up and choked it and yielded no fruit. You know what that's from, don't you? The sower soweth the seed. The seed is the word of God. Some fell by the wayside. That's one. Some fell among stony ground. That's two. Some fell among thorns. That's three. So ask yourself this question. How many people have come in and out of our churches? And what are the thorns? Mark chapter, he says three things here. Number one, the cares of this world. Number two, the deceitfulness of riches. And number three, the lust of other things. Let's get honest tonight. Let's not talk about conspiracies that are going to change the world. Let's talk about conspiracies that will change your life. How many of you know about cares of this world? Entertainments or things like that. Things that we'd rather do going to the racetrack than coming to the house of God. You know what Jesus called them? He said they're thorns and they're going to choke out the word of God in your life. And all of a sudden, your vineyard's going to have thorns in it. Now we know what it means. How many of you know what deceitfulness of riches is? Well, you're not nodding your head on this one. I think you're lying. We've spent, we've spent way too much time in this world trying to make money and keep it. And money is deceitful. And lust of other things. Should I, go, should I deal with that for a while? Make some people real nervous if I did. That's all right. We need to be nervous. We need to be sober. <coughs> because if we're not careful. You see, I, I preach this. There are four groups that the seed falls on. Only one of them goes to heaven. The other three don't. And the third group 
is a group that I'm looking at here tonight that if we're not careful, the thorns are going to grow up in our briar patch, in our, or in our vineyard, in our garden. How many of you believe that? Say amen. amen. Let's be careful. The world we live in, let's be careful. Now watch this. You heard of the movie The Omen? It was about the birth of the Antichrist. You know what his last name was? That was his first name. His name was Damien Thorne. Whoever wrote this movie knew what they were talking about. They were inspired. And the symbol found upon his skull that identified him as the Antichrist was a triple six. It was a triple helix. Three strand DNA. So are you digging it so far? Do you understand why I think this is going to happen? And do you understand the danger that even us sitting in our churches can be in if we're not careful? Even us preachers. Amen? Amen. Even us preachers. In fact, they'll go after us first. Let's be careful that we get our old plows out and plow up our stony ground and build a fence around our garden so the seed don't fall by the wayside. And let's be very, very careful that we don't let those thorns that you and I both know we have choke out the Word of God. I want to be fruitful for Jesus Christ. Can I hear you say amen?